Hi everyone. My name is Rahul and I'm uh, your host today. Uh, today we have uh, Mauricio from Diagrid with us and he will introduce himself in a minute. Uh, and before we do that, just a quick housekeeping item. Uh, if you have any questions, please put it in the right hand side of the LinkedIn messages and we will get to it uh, while Mauricio is presenting and we won't wait till the end for the Q&A. It will be a more of an interactive session. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get started. Mauricio, over to you. Hey, Rahul, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for having me in this webinar. Uh, I'm really excited to be presenting here. I've been looking into Big Cluster and some of other projects from Love Labs for, for a long time now, and I'm a big fan. So it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, yeah, so on today's presentation, I will be talking a little bit about Big Cluster. I will be talking a little bit about the project I'm working for that it's called Dapper. Uh, that's the, the thing that we are building uh, at Diagrid. So I, let me share my screen and uh, maybe start with the presentation. But as Rahul mentioned, let's try to keep it interactive, right? I cannot see the questions that you are typing live because I'm sharing my screen and my presentation. But if you have any questions, I guess that Rahul, you can read it to me, right? Yep. And yeah, and let's keep it interactive, right? So uh, if you have any questions while I'm presenting or while I'm talking about a specific topic, please feel free to stop me and uh, let's have a conversation instead of just a, a one-way uh, you know, uh, video here. So the title, uh, a specific title for the presentation and the main topic that I wanted to focus today is around like being cost efficient. Uh, and this is something that is becoming more important into the Kubernetes space lately. And also about like platform building and how Big Cluster can help you if you're building your own platform uh, on top of Kubernetes. So I will be mixing these topics and showing some examples about what can you get out, uh, uh, what can you kind of like create today and how can you make it a little bit more cost efficient depending on the use cases that you want to implement. As Rahul mentioned, my name is Mauricio Salatino. I'm at Salavoy. I will be presenting uh, these topics in a way, like it's, it's more like a journey, like starting with some challenges around Kubernetes why platform engineering is something uh, very kind of like on the on the hype on the kubernetes space and why you know we need to be cost efficient in a multi-cluster world because again we just need to try to save some resources and some money because there are some other more important things that we can be doing with that i also wrote a blog post about uh, this topic uh, in the loft.sh you know website that you can check out uh, uh, but today i will be showing kind of like an advanced like a little bit more advanced example of Kind of like the same topic. So I think that let's get started. So first, like my introduction, Mauricio Salatino, I've been working on a bunch of open source projects during this last, you know, 10 years. And I'm currently working for a company that's called Diagrid. Uh, this company focuses on this project that it's called Dapper. We help people to run production uh, workloads into, you know, on top of Kubernetes using tools like Dapper or some other open source projects. And one of the things that I'm doing nowadays uh, is uh, one initiative in my blog uh, where I'm just writing reports about different projects in the CNCF and companies associated to these projects. So if you're interested in that kind of like content, keep an eye on my blog, that is salavoy.com. Uh, yeah, and as part of this kind of like journey of contributing to different open source projects, I've been writing a book that is titled a Platform Engineering on Kubernetes. This is still not printed, it's not finished, but you can access it in the, you know, in the Manning website. And this QR code uh, will take you there. But also if you use that code there, Salatino40, you will get a 40% discount off on the book price. If you're interested in platform engineering or the tools that I will be mentioning on this webinar, feel free to check this out because this might, might be for you, right? And I'm always open for feedback and you know, showing some examples of the book. So, if you have any questions around this topic, feel free to reach out. So let's get started, right? Like Kubernetes. I'm assuming that if you are watching this, uh, you know, this webinar, you are familiar with Kubernetes and how it works, how kind of like, like the basics on how to use it, how to interact as, uh, you know, as an operation team or from the infrastructure side or how to create new clusters in different cloud providers. I'm assuming that you have like a basic knowledge about what Kubernetes is and what kind of like problems it comes to solve, right? But no matter if you understand Kubernetes well enough, you will start, and if you start adopting Kubernetes in your organization, you are going to face a bunch of challenges. And I wanted to focus on three challenges today 
that are more related to the topics of my presentation, but you know, there are a number of things that your organization will need to go through in order to successfully adopt uh, Kubernetes as the main platform for deploying and delivering software. So the, one of the first things that when you're starting your Kubernetes journey, you will find out is that with a single cluster, you cannot do much. You will need to create more, create and manage more than a single Kubernetes cluster inside your organization. That might be related to the fact that, you know, if you're running production workloads, you don't want to be running all the development side of things or all the tooling for building applications inside the same cluster. So then you will just go and create different clusters for different purposes, maybe for different teams, maybe for testing or quality assurance, you have specialized clusters that are large, or maybe you are training some machine learning models and you need to have some clusters with GPUs enabled, right? Like that applications that can access GPUs from the underlying uh, compute resources. No matter which reason you have, no matter how big your organization is, you will need more than a single Kubernetes cluster. And the moment that you have more than one, then you need to start thinking about how do you manage them, right? And as part of those conversations about how many clusters do we have, how many clusters do we need, there is a second challenge and there is a second big discussion about multi-tenancy. If you have more than a single cluster, first of all, you need to figure out who is going to own that cluster, who is going to manage it, but also who is going to access it and how are you going to give access to different teams, different maybe customers to access to these specific uh, clusters. If you, uh, the, like the multi-tenancy discussions uh, can be different and based on different topics and different requirements. So there are some conversations about when do you need to create new clusters and for whom and how those clusters needs to be configured. And another kind of conversation is if we have a single large clusters that we want to share across multiple tenants, how do we do that in an efficient way, right? All these conversations are part of the Kubernetes adoption journey. Like every organization goes through these questions and they need to come up with their, you know, domain specific answers for this, right? Like they have different challenges, so they will need different solutions. And the third, uh, the third topic, the third challenge that you will face when adopting Kubernetes is related to cost. And that's why, you know, uh, this presentation is about being a little bit more cost effective on how do we manage, create clusters, and also manage the tools inside these clusters. As you might know, right, like going and creating clusters on Kubernetes, on, on cloud providers, it's kind of expensive. And it's not expensive because you are running a lot of applications inside those clusters. It is expensive because you need to actually pay some compute resources to run Kubernetes itself. And if you are delegating that to the cloud provider, then the cloud provider will charge you for those services and for those compute resources. Kubernetes in general, they are like region based. That basically means that you create a cluster in a specific region or an availability zone. And because they want to be fault tolerant, they might create replication in different data centers. And then because they have compute in different data centers, they need to have the routing capabilities, the right load balancers to route traffic between different data centers. And all that infrastructure actually costs money. So when you are creating a cluster, you will need to pay for these compute resources and for all this infrastructure for your clusters to run. If you let your teams to go and create new Kubernetes clusters whenever they want, uh, for any reason, what's happening is at the end of the month, you're going to get a large bill and you will need to pay for that. And I guess that if you're using the clusters, it's not a big deal. But the problem is that if you're just paying for clusters that nobody is using, then, then definitely you have a problem. You can be actually more cost efficient on that side. So in order to solve some of these challenges, you will see that in the cloud native space, there is uh, a topic that is pretty hot right now. And everybody, like a bunch of companies are talking about platform engineering on top of Kubernetes. That's why the title of my book as well, right? And most of things around platform engineering is, it's kind of like uh, the next step on the adoption journey. It's how do we mature our practices to make sure that we solve all these challenges that I mentioned before in an organized way. So when you see presentations about platform engineering or when you hear platform engineering in the context of, of the CNCF and the cloud native space, what you're going to see happening is that they talk about creating a new platform team that it's dedicated to try to come up with solutions for these challenges that I mentioned before. How do we create clusters? Um, for who do we create clusters? For which teams do we create clusters? And for which teams do we share the same cluster? Um, how cost efficient are we? What can we do in order to make you know, our solutions more efficient? 
And this platform team, it's a dedicated team that is in charge of actually coming up with solutions and encoding all these solutions under a single entity that it's basically been defined as the platform. But what's important, at least from this slide, is that this team is basically there to serve other teams like development teams, like application development teams, or data scientists, or the infrastructure people who is configuring cloud resources, or SREs as, as that are just keeping our applications alive. So no matter in which presentation are you like attending around platform engineering, you will see the concept of having a platform team coming up with the decisions to actually create something more concrete in the shape of a platform. When you're creating platforms, you are going to be talking about platform APIs and making sure that the platform is self-service. The whole idea here is again, that if a, 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 you know, a development team needs a new environment to do their work, they can just go to the platform, request a new development environment, send a request to the platform and the platform will provision that environment for, for you, right? How the platform provisions, you know, these environments and how do we take, you know, all the changes that developers are creating and push that into our production environments is, is you know, is kind of what this platform uh, engineering bus is all about, right? Like how do we improve our processes to get, you know, all the things that developers are doing in front of our customers. But as part of the platform engineering team, you actually need to decide which tools are you going to use and Going back to that example, right? Like if the development team needs a new environment, are we allowed to create a new Kubernetes cluster in cloud provider X, or should we go to a different cloud provider or should we have an alternative solution to be a little bit more cost efficient on that? If you haven't heard about platform engineering, I strongly recommend you to check, you know, a white paper that was released by the uh, tag app delivery from the CNCF. And in this white paper, what, what we are trying to do is we are trying to come up with the definitions about what platform engineering means, how to create platforms with all this cloud native space, uh, space tooling, and uh, yeah, all the other definitions that will help you to kind of conceptualize how all these things comes together in your, for your organization. So I wanted to show you quickly, uh, like an example of one of these platforms, an example, like it's a very simple example that I built using Kubernetes as my platform cluster that contains all the platform tools and uh, it exposes a platform API that allows like development teams to go and request new environments. And we will see how you know, we are using tools like the clusters in order to implement this, this kind of like platform pattern. So in this case, the, uh, app, the, the application development team, they go to the platform APIs, send a request asking for a new development environment. And then the platform will use some tools in order to provision that for them. Right. So as soon as the platform receives the request, the platform tools are going to start doing some work to provision that new environment that was requested. And at the end, uh, the, you know, the development team will have a new, in this case, a new cluster uh, with a bunch of tools and their application already installed for them to start making changes. Right. So in this way, we are creating a very simple platform that development teams can go, send a request, get an environment back with the application already running in there and already configured. So if they need to change something in the application, they can go ahead, do all the changes there, validate that the changes are working, and then let the platform take those changes into their production environment. Uh, in order to implement this simple platform, I've used two tools. One is Crossplane. Uh, Crossplane is a very popular CNCF project that allows you to create cloud resources. Right, so imagine uh, Crossplane as a tool that it will allow you to create databases, even Kubernetes clusters in different cloud providers. So Crossplane is a, a Kubernetes extension. You install it in a Kubernetes cluster. Then you give the credentials to basically go to a different cloud provider and create resources on your behalf. And it will actually do that using the Kubernetes APIs. So if you want to create, for example, a database in Google Cloud, you will create a YAML uh, resource uh, for the Kubernetes API to say, I want a database with these parameters, with this you know, amount of storage, with this version of the database, and you will send that to Kubernetes and Crossplane will go and provision that database in Google Cloud, let's say. And Cluster is the project from Loft that I, I'm presenting here about. It's, it's, a, it's an, um, an alternative. So instead of creating a cluster in a cloud provider, we are going to create a virtual cluster in my own Kubernetes cluster in here. So let's take a look at that. Um, the cluster works uh, in this way. Like again, I, you know, I'm presenting for Loft, and I, I'm 
100% sure that there are a bunch of videos explaining in detail this image. But what BigCluster does, it, it allows me to hear it on the bottom, I can see my main Kubernetes cluster that they call host Kubernetes cluster that has an API server. It has etcd as the database to store all the resources. And it has a bunch of controller uh, managers and the scheduler to define where my containers are going to run in the cluster. I can actually go and use that Kubernetes cluster and install things. But what you can do with virtual cluster, with the cluster in this case, is create these virtual clusters uh, inside the host cluster. And what vCluster is going to do is it's going to create a new API server. That basically means that I can give my tenants access to what they will look at like a normal Kubernetes cluster. They're going to store all their resources in a different database. It's not etcd. And they will actually go into reuse the scheduler from the host cluster. So whenever a tenant requests to deploy an application into the vCluster, vCluster will use this component here in green that it's called the sinker to send and schedule the workloads into the host cluster. This allows you to have a way to share different API servers with your tenants. So they have full isolation on the API server side of the cluster. So they can deploy any amount of applications without seeing all the applications that are being deployed by all the other tenants. While at the same time, you are reusing the host cluster for scheduling and running all your workloads. Right. So you're having some isolation between your different tenants without the need of going and creating new control planes into your cloud provider. And those control planes are the expensive part of things. So let's take a quick look at uh, what I did for this demo. You can follow this demo. Uh, I have a link uh, there like for my repository of where the demo is that you can follow. Also in the blog post from Loft, you can see the repository for this demo. So let's go to the terminal here. And in the terminal, I'm connected to my platform cluster, right? So let me list the namespaces here. Um, you can see that in my um, in my cluster, I have crossplane installed, right? And I do not need to have any like big cluster related tool installed in there. But what I can do now, because I've configured crossplane to create uh, you know big clusters for me, uh, I can use this new resource that I've created here. So team, let's see, team B, right? So I have a new resource that allows me to define what a new development environment, right? Like this type uh, environment. And it has like here a label saying, okay, I want the development environment, right? And development environments are usually more ephemeral, right? Like it's not the cluster that I want to create and maintain for two years. It's more something that if the development team wants to do some work, they will create a new environment. And after a week when the work is done, they will shut that down, right? So in this case, for implementing this development environment, I'm using the cluster behind the scenes. But I'm not sharing that with my development team. My development team, the only thing that they need to know is that they need to connect to the platform clusters and send these kind of requests in order to get new environments for them to work. So what I will do here is I will send this to my platform cluster, uh, team B development environment, right? So I'm sending this request to the platform cluster and the platform is telling me, okay, I received your request for creating this new uh, environment that it's called Team B Dev Environment. And I will start provisioning that for you. So because it is a Kubernetes resource, and this is the beauty of using Crossplane, is that it's I'm encapsulating you know, different technologies and different mechanisms behind you know, a Kubernetes resource. I can list all my environments in the same way that I would list all my deployments in a Kubernetes cluster. And I can see that I have an environment for team A that it was already created like some hours ago. Uh, and I have the new environment that I requested that it's not ready yet because it's being provisioned. Usually when you go and create a cluster in a cloud provider, it takes you around like seven minutes uh, just to be ready depending on the cloud provider. And, and that's okay, you know, the development team actually can wait for that. But if you are creating new clusters for different tenants, for different customers, uh, sometimes you might need to be faster than that. You don't want to uh, make your customers wait for seven minutes in order to start using your services, right? So I can see here that after 60 seconds, around 60 seconds, you know, my second cluster is ready. My, sorry, my second uh, development environment is ready. And I can connect to this new cluster as a completely isolated cluster, right? If you see here, I'm listing my namespaces uh, and you will see that I have a bunch of tools installed. But now I will use the vCluster CLI, vCluster connect, in order to connect to the cluster, to the development environment that I've just created. 
And as, as, as if you remember, basically what I'm doing here is I'm creating a new Kubernetes cluster for this development team to work with their application. So I have used the cluster connect here. This is pretty much like uh, connecting to a remote cluster, but in this case, it's a virtual cluster. It's not a real cluster. And it's connecting to this you know, cluster that it, that it has that specific name. If I do, uh, if I list my namespaces now, you will see that they are not the same tools that I have installed in the in the platform cluster because again, this is the cluster for my development team to do their work. And I can list here. I can run this command in order to list, uh, you know, the URL the URLs for the services that I'm running. And you can see that uh, I'm just clicking here and I'm accessing, you know, this application. Uh, that is basically inside a virtual cluster running. And BigCluster is exposing this uh, automatically. And this application is a very simple Dapper and Knative application. I will explain a little bit about these two projects in a bit. But what I can do here is I can say something like, hello, hello, uh, Loft webinar, right? I can do that. And this application is basically um, using a, a bunch of components to store data into the database. And this, this section of the application is reading from that database. And then I have another service here that it's basically getting some notifications, asynchronous notifications uh, whenever things, things are working. So this is all already working in there. Uh, the application is working. And what you can see is that, again, I have an isolated space for my development team to work against this cluster. I've created this cluster dynamically, and I'm using B cluster to create this. That basically means that I'm not creating a cluster in Kubernetes, like I'm not creating another Kubernetes cluster in a cloud provider, but I'm creating a virtual cluster in the cluster that I already have. I can exit this cluster and get back to my platform cluster. And I can, of course, connect to my team A environment as well, right? Like if I go back here to the terminal and connect to the team, uh, you know, to the team A environment, uh, you know, Different teams can be working on different changes and modifying the same application, but different instances. And I can see here that um, I have, you know, a different set of URLs for the other instance of the application. So for now, I think that I will just stop there because I wanted to um, cover a bunch of other things about how these tools are working and the benefits of using big clusters in these kind of scenarios. Um, but if again, if you have any questions about what I'm showing so far. Please feel free to drop a comment here in the webinar in LinkedIn, and uh, you know Rahul will, will read that question to me. But if not, I will just keep going, uh, just to keep the flow of the presentation. And uh, uh, yes, where is your quick question? Uh, not technical, but let's say you yep. have uh, all these tools out there. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you manage flexibility and standardization? Because I think standardization is something uh, companies look for but mm -hmm. then they also want flexibility in terms of using these various tools and giving power to the developers to choose them maybe, or even the mm -hmm. platform teams. So how do you kind of manage uh, those two things? So when you when you mean like standardization, I think that like the great thing about Big Cluster is that it is actually exposing the same API server uh, for each. So every time that you create a Big Cluster, you get like a purely, you know, identical Kubernetes API server for your tenants. So from the standard point of view, right? Like your tenants, when they connect to your big cluster, they will think that they are actually interacting with the real Kubernetes cluster. And I think that that's, that's pretty good because that basically means that you can use all the tools that you're using with Kubernetes with big cluster, just because they are sharing the same API, kind of like standards on the same API server. Got it. Does that answer part of your question? Part of, yes, yes. Good. Thank great, you. great. You can go ahead. Cool. So what I've showed is basically simple platform based on Kubernetes. I was running my host cluster in Google Cloud. Uh, when I sent that environment resource to the platform APIs, I got a new a separated development environment using the cluster that basically created a different you know, instance of the Kubernetes API server for the team connecting to that cluster. They didn't even know where that cluster was running. They actually don't care as soon as they can interact with their application. And I use Crossplane to actually create that big cluster instance and configure the application inside that cluster. That's the power of, of, of Crossplane and that's the power of big cluster, right? Again, as I mentioned before, because big cluster is fully compatible with all the Kubernetes tooling, uh, 
I could install a bunch of uh, tools and deploy my Kubernetes workloads inside of that big cluster in the same way that I would do with the real Kubernetes cluster. And at the end, I had my uh, developer interacting with their new environment that has their application running in it. And it has a bunch of tools already installed, like in this case, Knative and Dapper. And I think that I'm mentioning Knative and Dapper because I wanted to touch a little bit on that you know, developer space. Because creating Kubernetes clusters is just the beginning, right? Like having a Kubernetes cluster will not help you that much with your developers. You will, you will want to add new tools into the clusters so they can do stuff. So More in field, actually, uh, go for it, yes. Uh, one question came up. You can see it on mm -hmm. the screen here. Does adding V cluster add latency for API server? That's a very good question. So if I go back to this this screen, right? So the good thing about big cluster is because it, it is actually creating a new API server. You are not actually overloading the host API server because tenants will talk to the big cluster API server directly without going through the host cluster API server, right? So for your host cluster, like the cluster the main cluster that it's running all the big clusters, none of your tenants will go to that API server. They will go straight to their big cluster API server. And all those like big cluster API servers are going to be isolated. So tenants will, tenants will not be sending loads to other tenants to their other API servers. Everything is kind of like isolated and that's the beauty of big cluster in this case. So hopefully I can answer that question as well. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about developers. And if you have a follow-up on that question, please feel free to, to ask. And, and I'm guessing that we have a lot of big cluster folks here as well. I'm, I'm not the big cluster expert. I'm a big fan, but I'm not an expert. So for deeper questions, I might delegate that to, to the big cluster folks. So as I was mentioning before, having a cluster, in this case, having a big cluster, it's part of the equation, but I guess that it's the starting point, right? Like, now using these kind of tools, like using Crossplane and Big Cluster and a bunch of other cloud resources, we know how to create things. We know how to create clusters. We know how to configure them in a way. And we know how to install tools into these clusters. But if we don't install the right tools inside of our clusters, we will make the life of people consuming and interacting with these clusters a little bit painful because we will be pushing the decision onto them on which tools do they need in order to do their work. And we can do much better. And I think that's part of kind of like platform engineering, deciding which tools to install in the clusters so developers and application development teams can be more efficient. And that's why I wanted to talk about these two projects, Knative and Dapper. And I don't want to talk about too much about the projects themselves, but I want to talk about how these projects interact with the cluster uh, for you to understand a couple of very, really nice features that the cluster is providing in their latest version. So, Again, when I think about installing tools into uh, a Kubernetes cluster, I think about a bunch of things, like the, like allowing teams to experiment, for example, with uh, implementing different release strategies so they, they can deploy more software and then decide how to forward traffic to different versions. And also I want to uh, make sure that developers have a bunch of tools, like what I'm calling platform capabilities here, that allows them to focus on coding features of their applications instead of figuring out how to connect to different infrastructure components like databases, message brokers, how to get credentials for different services and all that stuff. So I don't know how many of you know about this project. Knative is a pretty, mat a pretty mature project in the CNCF space. And it's mostly uh, associated with serverless and uh, allowing you to implement more like that container as a service uh, approach. Knative is a Kubernetes extension. That basically means that you have your Kubernetes cluster and you need to install Knative on top of your cluster to use some of the Knative features. And I would say that the main feature, at least one of the main things that I like about Knative is that it allows you to uh, run containers easily without understanding you know, all the low level Kubernetes building blocks such as deployments, you know, replica sets, pods, services, ingresses, and all that stuff. Instead of pushing teams to learn about all these low-level concepts, Knative provides you a high-level service that basically allows you to say, you know, this is my container, just please run it, give me an URL so I can access to it, right? So more like that idea of 
like a container as a service approach that many cloud providers are offering. You give me, you know, the Docker container that you want to run. You just send me a bunch of, you know, uh, of environment variables to configure, and I will just take it and run it for you. I will make it scalable like up uh, to many replicas if if I'm getting a lot of traffic, or I will downscale it to zero if the application is not getting any requests. All that stuff is being handled by Knative. And I will be showing how Knative is installed in these big clusters uh, in a bit. The other project that I wanted to mention, uh, again, like about platform capabilities, is this project called Dapper that basically allows you, uh, Dapper stands for uh, you know distributed application runtime. And it basically allows you to connect easily to a bunch of infrastructure or components. Dapper is another Kubernetes extension that you go and install into your Kubernetes clusters. And when I'm saying install, basically you go to your host cluster and you know, send a couple of requests to install Dapper. And uh, what you will have in your cluster now is a bunch of Dapper components, a bunch of Dapper controllers that are looking into Dapper resources and you know, performing some operations for your applications. If you go to the Dapper website, you will see that Dapper defines itself as APIs for solving distributed application challenges. And this is something that developers really care, right? Like they really care about like storing a state uh, into a, you know, a persistent storage, like a database or a key value store, or exchanging messages in an asynchronous way, like with publish and subscribe. They also care about resiliency policies between, you know, how many retries do I need to send to a different service before I consider it down? How do I build resiliency on top of my services? So Dapper basically encapsulate all these you know, common patterns and best practices about how to solve these distributed challenges into Dapper components. So what I've created, like the application that I showed you before, that it's storing data into a database is actually using Dapper uh, components in order to do that. But in order to use Dapper, as I mentioned before, I need to have Dapper installed in my cluster, right? And that, installing things into clusters becomes a problem when you are dealing with multiple clusters that they are all using the same tools in very similar ways, but you need to run the same tool in every cluster. So Dapper, kind of like as I mentioned before, when you install it in a cluster, you have a set of you know, controllers, uh, Kubernetes controllers that are looking into Dapper resources. And one of the Dapper resources is the component resource that basically define uh, you know, in this case, the state store component defines on how to connect to a Redis database and how to abstract away that connection from the application that you are writing. So my application that I've showed you before, in order to write data to Redis, it's actually using Dapper APIs, HTTP APIs, to interact with the Dapper component instead of adding dependencies to interact directly with, with Redis. So from an application perspective, I know that I can save and read data from Redis but I don't need to connect directly to Redis from my application. And that allows me to remove dependencies from the application, making my containers leaner and saving some money on transferring containers around. But this all comes with the cost. And because you are adding functionality to your Kubernetes clusters, as I mentioned before, if you have four Kubernetes clusters and you want to enable all your applications running in all these clusters to, be, to consume Dapper and to connect to Redis using Dapper, you will need to install Dapper in every cluster, right? First of all, there is like an automation side of things that every time that you create a Kubernetes cluster, then you need to make sure that you go and install Dapper in it. But in this case, you're running, you know, four versions, like four instances of the Dapper components in every cluster, and they are all doing exactly the same. So I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, I try to optimize things. and. When I see this, I, I, I think that we can do much better, right? Depending on your, you know, on your architecture and your isolation and the reasons why you have four different clusters in, in, the, in the beginning, you can actually be a little bit more clever on where do you install things and how do you share resources. So we already saw that for our like, you know, demo that I showed before, we are using big clusters. So instead of having four Kubernetes clusters, if we use big clusters, we will have for big clusters in the same Kubernetes host cluster, right? So for my example, I have like the host cluster running on Google Cloud and I'm creating different clusters for each team. But even in that case, I will need to install tools in each of these big clusters. Rahul, do you have a question? Yes. So Manuel has a question uh, when big cluster plus cross plane, mm -hmm. 
provisions new cloud provider clusters? How is the networking concerns managed? That's a very good question. I will go back to that question in a bit. Okay. Okay. So okay. I, I will I will try to finish this and I will go back to that question uh, in a bit. Cool. Uh, so yeah. So in this case, what I was showing is here that I have four big clusters, but I will need to go and install Dapper into every build or build or cluster in order to be able to consume uh, Dapper for my applications, right? The same with Knative, right? Like if I want to use Knative in all my big clusters, I will just need to go and install the control plane, all the controllers, Knative controllers in each of these big clusters. And that again, sounds like we can do much better. And actually we can because the cluster version 0 0.15, uh, yeah, 15, actually includes a mechanism that allows you to share control planes uh, like and tools that are installed on the host cluster into the big cluster without installing these tools in there, right? So in this case, I've installed Dapper in my host cluster. And for every big cluster that I'm creating using crossplane in this case, I am setting some parameters to say, hey, when I create this big cluster, I want to reuse all the functionality that it's been provided by Dapper, but that it's installed in the host cluster and it's not installed in every big cluster. In order to do that, um, is create, when, when you create big clusters, basically you can set a bunch of parameters and a bunch of, a bunch of configurations. And this is showing here uh, how I'm saying that for every big cluster that I'm creating, in this case, I'm setting a bunch of things and one of those like sync generic properties is about like what kind of things do I want to share between the parent cluster, the host cluster, and every big cluster that I'm creating. As you can see here, some of the resources that I'm syncing back and forth are Dapper components, Dapper subscriptions, and Dapper configurations. This will basically mean that I can start sharing these uh, resources that I'm creating on big cluster with the host uh, cluster, and Dapper that it's installed there will process these resources and then big cluster will send back the results into the big clusters. All these advanced mechanisms just to save money and resources on installing Dapper on all these big clusters. So the second demo is not much more than uh, showing you that uh, in every big cluster that I've created here, I'm inside the big cluster, uh, right? And you can see here that I do not have Dapper or Knative installed in these big clusters. But if I go to the parent cluster, like the platform cluster, you can see here that I have Dapper installed and I have Knative Server installed. And again, this, when I install these projects, I can see that I have like CRDs here, like custom resource definitions from each of these projects. Uh, I can do grep Knative, let's say. So you can see all these types are being part of the Knative installation. And in order for me, as like as a tenant interacting with the cluster, to create new Knative applications or to create new Dapper applications, right? Like in this case, Dapper, I will need to have these resources also available in the cluster. By applying these configurations that I showed you before about like telling the cluster that I'm sharing some of this definition with my big clusters, I can go to the cluster, connect to one of the clusters that I have. Now I'm connected to one of these big clusters. And if I list the CRDs that are available here, you can see that I have some Knative you know, resources available for this cluster and some Dapper uh, resources available as well, right? So in this case, I am reusing the functionality of Dapper and Knative inside the big cluster, but without having these tools installed in this specific big cluster. I'm just sharing the same installation for all the clusters. And that's again, saving me uh, some money and some time by not installing all the tools in every big cluster that I create. Uh, as you can see here, I can list all the Knative services and I can list all the uh, Dapper components. And as I mentioned before, right, I'm using uh, state store and Redis. And if I list this component, right, describe component state store, you can see that this state store component is connecting to a Redis. But that it's not also like this Redis instance is not running on the big cluster, but it's running on the host cluster. And this syncer capability and this functionality also allows me to say that, you know, I will do a, lo a, a local lookup for this DNS record. But if it's not here in the big cluster, I will also check in the host parent, in, like in the host cluster, to see if that service exists there. And in this case, that's how it's, it's configured. I'm reusing an instance of Redis that is running on the host cluster. And I can access the same instance from all the e clusters. 
I'm just choosing to do this because I wanted to uh, test it in that way, but you can actually create different instances of Redis for each of your tenants if you need to do so, right? There is no hard requirement on doing it this way. This is just an example. So I mentioned before, you can actually run the exact same demo from this URL. Uh, let me see if I can make it bigger. Uh, and I know that uh, Rahul and uh, Patrick will share this at some point uh, with you folks. I think that there is a QR code for that as well. And as you can see here, like in instructions, you can actually run this demo in your um, in your laptop. You don't really need to have access to any cloud provider. You can create a kind cluster, install all the tools, and just run exactly the same thing that I've just showed you. I hope that you can like give it a try. And you know, if you have any feedback, uh, feel free to reach out. There are tons of things that we can do on top of this demo, adding more projects and adding more capabilities. Uh, so whenever a team creates a new development environment, they have other tools, other applications also installed in there just to demonstrate uh, more things and you know other use cases that you might encounter in your own organizations. Also check out the blog. I've already shared that as well. And I'm sure that, you know, that there is a QR code for that as well. And feel free to check my blog uh, before I answer, before I try to answer some of the questions that you folks have. Feel free to subscribe there. Uh, and I'm building a bunch of things in there and publishing articles almost every week. So if you're interested in that as well, feel free to reach out. Let me see. Cool. Whoa, so, I, can, I can see a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. So, good, good, good. Uh, uh, Boris, do you want to take the question uh, Manuel asked yes. about the... So let's Patrick bring it up. Yeah, right here. Uh -huh. Interesting. So Crossplane will not do any magic, right? Like uh, imagine that, so in my demo, I'm creating, um, you know, new big clusters for every development environment. That's kind of like one of the implementations that I've decided to create. I can decide to create new Google Cloud, like GKE clusters for, um, for my, not my staging environments, right? Like, or my production environments. So to create real clusters. What Crossplane will do there is it's going to take a definition of what the cluster, how the cluster should look like, like with all the parameters that you actually need to fill in, you know, in GKE, like in the, in the, in the screens, uh, inside Google Cloud Platform, inside the screens, like all the wizards to create new clusters, you will need to provide similar information. As part of those configurations, you will also need to define what kind of networking do you want to implement and how accessible do you want to make your cluster, right? So you will need to actually define the security policies to say, okay, I want to expose this cluster to the internet or I want to put it on a VPC or you know, use different certificates for, for that cluster. You can actually configure all those things using Crossplane and it actually depends on what kind of requirements do you have in order to define how those configurations will look like. Check, definitely check the Crossplane website for more configurations and support for different cloud providers. But actually, at the end of the day, you're not creating a, a Kubernetes cluster only. You're creating a network. You're creating probably a VPC. You're creating you know, credentials, uh, identity roles, and a bunch of other things. So hopefully that answers uh, Manuel's questions. Yes. And uh, we can go to the next question by Kevin. Mm -hmm. For cluster permission management, would the vCluster simplify applying the same identity management to other cloud providers' identity management? That's a very good question. I guess that, again, like B, what vCluster does is just create like a new virtual clusters inside this a cluster that already exists. So if you need more configuration on top of that, then you will need to configure how the vCluster gets created and who can access that. I think that's not purely a responsibility of the big cluster itself, but it's more like a definition on your organization about what do you want to do with that new big cluster and how that big cluster is configured or secured for your particular use cases. In general terms, when you create a big cluster, again, you are creating a new API server. So how do you configure that API server? It's completely up to you. Big cluster is not doing much around it. I can see some other interesting questions coming. Yeah, great. I can so, see, yeah. Bhavni, I think it's a question. Uh, she it's says, it? I have a question. So vCluster enables on-demand quick K8 environments for developers. 
uh, yes, to test the application. Yeah. That's 100%. 100% the, the purpose of showing kind of like that demo, you can quickly create new development environment. You can easily install applications into big clusters using Helm or any other tools that you're using to install applications in Kubernetes because at the end of the day, big cluster actually exposes the Kubernetes APIs. And yes, when you are uh, running multiple big clusters on top of a host cluster, you are using the host cluster compute power, right? So you are adding a little bit of overhead on top of your cluster to run these new API servers, but your applications will actually run on the resources of the host cluster. So yeah, depending on what kind of applications are you running is how do you size the host cluster to begin with. Yeah. Cool. Great, great, great. So Mauricio, we are at time while we kind of wrap up. If some questions come up, definitely we will mm -hmm. we'll bring them up. Uh, but any any last last minute thoughts? Um, I think that like, yeah, so remember that like CNCF uh, paper about like platforms. I think that that's important because no matter how, like where you are, like in your Kubernetes adoption journey, you will start finding these challenges of multi-tenancy being cost efficient, I think that big cluster as any other tool will help you to get there, but you need to actually understand how all the pieces fit together, right? Maybe cross-plane is for you. Maybe you are not into cross-plane and you're using some of the tools like Terraform or Pulumi. You actually need to make some of those decisions and having a platform team that is fully dedicated on, on coming up with these decisions is, is actually one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing forward to for people to look into and just get more informed about that. Thank you very much for sharing that that link uh, for the paper, and and yeah, and I think that like if anyone has any questions or if somebody wants to collaborate on building more advanced demos, feel free to reach out. I'm always open to do open source collaborations, you know, and and get in touch with people and have interesting conversations. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mauricio. And just before we wrap up, uh, a few things. Uh, We'll, we will post the post recording. It will stay actually on LinkedIn because it's a LinkedIn live. So you can come here and watch anytime. I will also post a link uh, in the chat. We will send it out as well uh, via email if you have registered. Uh, and then uh, we will send out uh, Mauricio's blog link, uh, the book if you want to purchase the, the, the code for that, the 40% discount. Uh, and also we will share the uh, the demo URLs, which Mauricio just just showed. If you have more questions about vCluster, you can join uh, slack.loft.sh uh, and you can join the vCluster channel there and you, you will get uh, uh, all the answers to your questions. Uh, if you want to learn more about Loft, definitely request a demo. You can go to Loft. You can get started as well uh, with the product or you can request a demo. Uh, but with that, uh, thank you so much, Mauricio. This was This was great. Uh, we had some really good conversation and uh, a lot of good questions. And uh, I hope we can do it uh, some other time again. Let's do it for sure. Yes. Perfect. Thanks, everyone, Thank you for folks. joining. Thank you.